Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, so what I would like to do here in this talk is give you basically a very broad introduction to how cyanobacteria, biotechnology and synthetic biology sort of could fit together and how maybe synthetic biology could advance um, these technologies. So um, I already got a very nice kind introduction to who we are. Um, just very briefly, um, as was mentioned, we're at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, um, here in this nice pretty town uh, to see on top. And um, we've only started last year and basically we're working mainly on cyanobacteria, but most of my group members are actually also uh, attending the summer school. So if you're interested in what we do in more detail that I probably will not have time to talk about, feel free to you know, come find them and talk to them. They will probably be happy to give you more insights into our research. Okay, but back to, uh, to this lecture. So what is this all about? So from the title, you can already see that basically we have three major elements in here. We have cyanobacteria, we have biotechnology, and we also have synthetic biology. And what I would hope is that during this talk, you sort of get the idea of how this all fits together and where we're trying to go with this. So first of all, first element is cyanobacteria. Um, I would think this is probably the element I have to give you the least introduction. So by now you will have um, heard about them and hopefully you're interested in these organisms or even more interested after this. Um, but just as a very, very brief reminder, what are cyanobacteria? So um, commonly they're quite often also called blue-green algae. This is um, due to historical reasons. But um, as you might all know, these are oxygenic photosynthetic bacteria. So these are prokaryotes, and actually they're the only known oxygenic photosynthetic bacteria. Um, they are an important uh, contributor to um, primary production, uh, carbon fixation on our planet. And some of them are also important for uh, nitrogen fixation. Not all of them are able to do that. In general, they are considered the progenitors of plastids. So the plastids uh, that you find in plants and algae at some point is in evolution, this is down to uh, an endosymbiotic event, and this is down to a cyanobacterium. And they are found pretty much anywhere on the planet, uh, in any sort of climate and uh, ecosystem. And part of this is what is really nice about these organisms is also that they are very metabolically versatile, and sort of their general characteristics make them very interesting for us um, for actually exploiting them and for utilizing them beyond um, their ecological significance, for example. Okay, so what do I mean with, you know, applying these organisms? How can we use them, so to say? So I would say maybe the simplest form of using these cyanobacteria would be by farming. Um, so maybe the, the only really big but very famous example of this is spirulina. I'm sure you've heard of this. Um, spirulina, what you can buy basically is down to um, two different cyanobacterial species. This is Arthrospira platensis and Maxima, although I think there were um, actually, the phylogeny and the, and the taxonomy of this is changing quite a bit as well, like for so many cyanobacteria. What is interesting about spirulina here is this is um, a cyanobacterium that grows at quite high pHs and it's highly salt tolerant, which means it grows in quite extreme conditions, which makes basically cultivating them maybe a bit easier because in the end there's less competition in these extreme com uh, environmental conditions. Okay, so spirulina farming these cyanobacteria. Why, why are people interested in this? Well, basically it's quite popular as a food supplement. So um, you can buy this either as a powder usually or also pressed into tablets. And this is down to the properties of the cyanobacterium. So there's a high protein content. It has a lot of antioxidants and minerals. These are sort of the health benefits why, why um, spirulina, what spirulina is advertised for. Um, people use it for all sorts of things. Um, you will maybe find these spirulina smoothies. Uh, you can bake with it, as you can see here in these buns. Whatever you know, you're interested in, I'm sure there is uh, a way of incorporating algae into, into the food. Um, in the end, um, we have to say that really this type of farming of cyanobacteria is already an established and serious application of these organisms. So just to give you an example here, this at the bottom uh, corner, this is an example from an artisan spirulina farm in France. Um, typically spirulina is grown in these sort of raceway ponds and there is sort of this trend towards a more smaller local and um, fresh production of these organisms for direct consumption. In general, um, the global spirulina market is estimated at around $350 million. 
uh, in 2018 and the idea is that this is supposed to I think double by 2025 or something like that so really this is a, a serious market there's a serious amount of money in this and this is already established so spirulina already took off this is already happening so to say okay but this is um, an application of course of cyanobacteria but maybe this doesn't really fit into um, what we would consider biotechnology yet so this brings me sort of to the second part of the talk. So how do now cyanobacteria fit together with biotechnology? So if you think of microbial biotechnology, this is dominated by very advanced, very well-established um, heterotrophic chassis. This can be uh, bacteria, for example, E. coli, bacillus, and all these other ones, or it can also be eukaryotic organisms, for example, yeasts. And this is obviously a sector that is established and things are up and running. They are improving dramatically at a quite ridiculous speed to some extent. So the question is, what do cyanobacteria have to do with this? You know, how do cyanobacteria sort of fit into this picture of microbial biotechnology? Well, really, we have to think, um, this is sort of down to global developments, I would say. So this is an example here in this uh, figure, you see the sustainable development goals from the United Nations um, sort of summed up. And uh, some of them might not be so relevant for microbial biotechnology, but others actually really are. And a lot of them, um, for example, here, affordable clean energy, climate action, or also here, life below water. There, there is several of them that really, um, things have to change and people are wanting them to change towards more sustainable systems, you know, using renewable sources, creating a circular bioeconomy. This is obviously, there's a lot of ideas, how can we address this and we can discuss, you know, how do we get there? But the big question is, of course, how? And um, we think that maybe cyanobacteria could have their role in sort of moving towards these more sustainable systems and basically making our, our planet sort of advance further and uh, and uh, use these organisms. So what is this down to? Why, why am I saying that cyanobacteria are relevant for this? So um, this is down to sort of very generically the perks of, I would say, green microbial chassis. So if you look here at these, um, what I call green microbial chassis, what you will notice is that I kind of lumped our cyanobacteria in together uh, with also eukaryotic microalgae. Um, so from an industrial point of view, when you read papers or when you look at these things and you read about spirulina, usually it will be referred to as a microalgae. And this is a, a general industrial thing. So when a biologist is asked, oh, you know, about cyanobacteria, they will say, oh, these are not microalgae. This is not a, this is not a eukaryotic organism, which is true. But um, in an industrial sense, they are sort of one group, I would say. And this is basically down to the fact that to grow them also in an industrial setting, they will have very similar requirements, I would say. And this is down to their photoautotrophic growth. So um, what do we need in order to make these guys grow? Um, basically, they fix carbon uh, from CO2 and they utilize sunlight basically as a free resource to turn this into chemical energy and to, to drive uh, their metabolism. And this is the same for these. And that's why from a, you know industrial point of view, they are kind of uh, one, one group together. Um, compared to maybe other green chassis, what we also have to say, they are relatively easy and relatively fast to grow, which of course is attractive for anything that's biotechnologically relevant. Um, and the additional thought is that also they can be cultivated on non-arable non land. So really here, we're not potentially directly competing with a land space, for, for example, growing crops. Um, some of them will also grow in salt water, which is always nice. So for example, some of these marine species, or there have also been a lot of studies looking at um, growing these organisms uh, in wastewater and sort of taking nutrients out of, uh, out of wastewater in the form of bioremediation. So um, this is sort of the general overview of what are the perks of these organisms. But now the question is, of course, what are they good for, which is here um, highlighted by the different types of products, I would say, that you could uh, produce with these organisms. And to put this into a more general context, um, I took actually these examples here of potential target markets uh, opportunities in Europe from a paper that you see referenced here at the bottom. And basically they say that there's six major ones, biofuels, bioplastics, 
biofertilizers, nutraceuticals, pharmaceuticals, and cosmetics. And I think this is probably quite representative in general for where microalgae and also cyanobacteria could play a role for a future uh, applic application within biotechnology. Okay, so we have identified the potential and where we could use them, but now what is sort of the reality? What is already out there? And how can we move our cyanobacteria into biotechnology? And really, this, um, there's already an example that I think goes into the right direction. So we're going back to spirulina. Spirulina is actually the only cyanobacterium that has a so-called grass status. Grass means generally regarded as safe. And what it means is it's basically um, safe for food consumption. And this is a couple of years old already. Um, but what you can see is that actually there was, for many, many years, um, the, the attempt was to actually find a natural blue colorant for food. And it turned out to be actually quite difficult to find something that's stable and that can be used, for example, here in sweets and confectionery. And um, of course, it's happy for me to say that uh, the cyanobacteria could do the job and they can actually um, deliver a solution for this. So here, for example, from Christian Hansen uh, from the website, I, I stole this. You can see that um, these um, blue and also green uh, colors in sweets, for example, they are actually produced by extracting pigments and proteins from spirulina. So what that means is we already have cyanobacteria moving into, cyan, into biotechnology and really we're starting to see that there is potential and to, to start to use that. However, apart from spirulina, really there is not that much out there. Apart from that, we're still very much in the infancy. So the big question is, why is that the case? So what is sort of holding back this transition into industry? Because as we will see also further down in the presentation, cyanobacteria are interesting and they can do all sorts of things and it has been shown with many proof of concepts but what is sort of the problem why why do we not you know see this popping up more in an actual industrial setting so this is down to challenges and limitations that um, i want to discuss in a little bit more detail to sort of figure out what is actually the problem where or where does it start i i thought i will introduce this maybe a little bit differently so if you go to web of science and you do a search for the topic of e coli um, basically what you get is that from 1945 until now until 2020 you get around half a million entries so half a million papers with the topic of e coli that is quite an impressive amount and even from this amount of papers, there's around 13% which fall into the category of biotechnology and applied microbiology. So that, that is a serious amount of studies that you know, have dealt with these problems and that have um, looked into how can we make and improve these systems. This is E. coli, so keep this in mind. If we now do this for cyanobacteria, so we have to think that we're, com we're, com uh, we're uh, actually uh, comparing cyanobacteria, a whole phylum of uh, of organisms with uh, a single species, yeah? And what we find is that there's around 35,500 uh, entries um, for the topic cyanobacteria. And at least around 10% of that is actually for applied papers, biotechnology and uh, also applied microbiology that it has been characterized at. So you can already see that this is a completely different dimensions. So this is more than 10 times less than what you, uh, what you find for E. coli. And that's very, I think, illustrative of the whole problem that we're sort of facing. So if you think of us working with cyanobacteria as Team Green, and if we look at existing microbial chassis in biotechnology, really maybe um, you know we can do the job if you're, for example, into cooking, I don't know, or something else, um, a hand whisk, it will do the job. But what we're really trying to compete with here are very advanced automated systems that have been you know, um, optimized over a long time. Maybe cooking is not your thing. You can use all sorts of other analogies here, uh, maybe a football team. So really our cyanobacteria clearly have potential so these guys can kick a ball. But in order to compete in the Champions League, the question is how do we get there? And at the moment, this is not very fair. So the question is, with what strategies, how can we smart about basically advancing these guys here in a relatively small amount of time as far as we can in order to be able to then compete here in the Champions League? And that is sort of the big question that we're trying to, to address and figure out. And obviously, there's no easy solution to that, but there's uh, ideas of how to go forward. 
um, in general to sort of put these challenges and limitations into very broad terms of into what categories do they fall. Well, as I mentioned before, um, we have many proof of concept studies in the laboratory that show they have potential, that show what they can possibly do. But now what we need is we need sort of the transition into pilot scale, we need to, the transition into industrial scale and really into a proper scale up to see these systems translated into an industrial setting. And there will be many challenges along this way because uh, these things are not linear and what you see in the lab might not be reflected very well if you scale this up. So there's a lot of things that need to be addressed and we need to understand and figure out in more detail. Now, if we sort of put all these different challenges and limitations into individual ca categories, I, I think the first one, which is maybe most relevant to what we are interested in, are the biological ones. So, of course, we are often working with wild type uh, strains, for example. We, um, we try to make them produce things, but really we need to understand these organisms better and we need to improve them to, to improve their productivity. Um, then there's obviously technical challenges. So actually transferring a system from here to the next scale and to the next scale, this is not so straightforward. This comes with uh, process and chemical engineering um, problems that have to be solved and that are not so straightforward necessarily. If you think about it, for example, if you pick up a fermenter of E. coli that works brilliantly, you cannot just dump your cyanobacteria into it and expect it to work. You have to think we have very different conditions. So for example, here, they need sunlight. So we need to get the light somehow into these production systems. And that can be tricky just to mention one challenge. So there's a lot of um, technical challenges that come with actually upscaling these systems. Now, something that we cannot deny, obviously this is also down to economic challenges. So if a system is not economically viable, then this is an issue and we have to figure out how can we make these systems economically viable? How can we uh, produce these cheaper or, or what are the way forwards to get there? Uh, and then maybe sort of tying a little bit into also to the other challenges. Um, we also obviously have legal and societal challenges. So if you think of legal ones, for example, in uh, Europe, we have quite strict regulations about genetically modified organisms, um, which we need to uh, figure out how our cyanobacteria fit in there. And we also have to explain to, to society, you know, what we are doing, what we're trying to do, what are maybe um, the advantages of these systems, but also what are the dangers and what are the risks and how are we addressing them to make sure that what we do is safe and is um, working for the purpose we're doing it. Um, so this sort of ties all into this together. If you're a little bit interested in sort of these legal aspects, there's an article that I referenced here at the bottom. This is not only for cyanobacteria, this is actually mainly for microalgae specifically in Europe, but um, this, this applies in the same way to cyanobacteria. So take a look if you're interested in that. And in general, this is obviously only a very short introduction and I cannot cover everything that is part of this, but I would be very interested to, during the discussion later on, maybe um, talk about this in a little bit more detail. So it would be interesting to also hear your thoughts. You know, how can we address and overcome these challenges and what do you think are maybe the most pressing ones of them that need to be solved first? Okay, um, of course there are challenges and limitations, but there have also been over the years very interesting and very important developments, I would say, to advance what we have. And I would say part of this is also the development of fast growing strains. So um, I'm giving here this example of this Nicococcus and Gartus strain, UTEX 2973 from Hematic Prakrasis group. And um, this was uh, published in 2015. And this strain basically is a freshwater strain, it only, uh, grows only autotrophically. And um, the shortest doubling time that they've reported is one and a half hours at 42 degrees, 1500 micro Einstein of light, so quite a lot of light and um, supplemented with 5% CO2, so also quite remarkable amounts of CO2. Why am I telling you this? If you think of one and a half hours, um, we're getting into doubling times that are similar to heterotrophic organisms, such as, for example, certain yeast strains. So here we have doubling times that are seriously impressive, especially for a fully autotrophic uh, organism. Uh, and this is where really things become more relevant also for biotechnology, because you have to grow these things in as least amount of time as possible. And if we can grow them in these time frames things are obviously a lot more um, attractive compared to uh, other heterotrophic organisms. 
maybe very quickly about this organism. Um, it's actually 99.8% uh, identical to a quite well-known model organism, uh, Synecococcus elongatus PCC7942. This is useful because um, if we want to advance the system further, we need to understand this organism. And that means that really, um, although this is maybe newly characterized, we already have a better idea of its biology than we would starting with a completely new strain. We have to say that. And there are some disadvantages of this particular one. So it's, for example, not naturally competent, as most of the model organisms that we usually use are. Um, however, there have been several tools also um, developed um, to engineer these guys, and things are advancing. So, um, yeah, you cannot get everything usually. Okay, this was just basically the first example, but since then there have been uh, several further fast-growing strains that have been characterized over the years. There's also two other Synecococcus elongatus, one's PCC11801 and 11802, and we're not going to go into much detail, but basically they're all kind of similar, but then under certain growth conditions, they're better than the other ones. So depending on what exactly your setup is, uh, it might be interesting to sort of um, see what sort of fits best with this. So for example, this guy here um, grows uh, faster, but then it needs higher CO2 than this guy the other way around. So, so depending on what you're exactly looking for, it's nice that we're starting to actually have sort of a, a broader choice to go from. Um, then the last one, which was published in 2020 now, just recently, is um, Synecococcus PCC11901. Uh, this is actually a marine strain, so this is interesting because the other ones are freshwater ones, and it's actually similar to PCC7002. And it can accumulate uh, a, dry, a dry weight of 33 grams per liter in batch culture. Um, with quite some CO2 supplemented, but this is quite a serious amount of biomass that you can grow from this strain, so that's quite extraordinary. And these are sort of the studies that are going into the right direction. Yeah? So here we're starting to see that we can actually grow these things quite fast, quite simply, and, and actually get serious amounts of biomass out of it. Okay, so basically this is the end of the, the idea of going from, we have challenges in biotechnology, but how can we address them in general? As a first aspect, we can to start with um, use organisms that grow faster. But really, as I told you, we're, we're trying to compete in the Champions League and we need to get there as fast as possible. And we're not going to get there if we don't use our own personal tricks to get there. And uh, this is down to basically the third topic I would like to introduce to you, another synthetic biology. So I really think that through synthetic biology, we can really sort of advance these things uh, faster in, in a more dedicated way, specifically targeting a product, for example, to, to make these systems more effective in a shorter amount of time. Um, I thought maybe very briefly, um, I will introduce sort of the core idea of synthetic biology. Um, this is obviously a big field and it's difficult to sort of just you know, put this into a box, um, but very basically and very generically, I would say uh, synthetic biology is sort of when biology meets engineering. So the idea of using principles from engineering to actually advance biology. So I'm sure you might have seen these, uh, these cycles that are uh, usually shown, where really this um, shows this iterative uh, approach to advance a system. Uh, and this is down to designing something first, then building and testing it. And then also importantly, also learning from what you've built and what the test results were to then go through in an iterative approach, next round of improving the system further through sort of this uh, cycles of improving something towards a certain goal. Um, I would say that synthetic biology has majorly been uh, sort of boosted by advances in DNA sequencing and also DNA synthesis. Um, mixed with basically much more advanced bioinformatic tools and high uh, throughput methods. In general, um, the idea of this engineering component is more this sort of rational design to construct a biological system from individual parts. Um, but what is really important is that this is also quite open community and really um, there's a big effort towards uh, standardizing these individual parts that you can then pick up when you uh, you know, transfer it into a different system. So this is this idea of a modular standardization of parts, and we'll actually get back to that in a second again. So um, this is obviously nice. I mean, this is synthetic biology, but what does this have to be with cyanobacteria, and how could it actually help? Um, first of all, I want to just briefly maybe point out also something we have to keep in mind, that 
the, these are all nice ideas and we would like to use them. However, there's also certain limitations to actually use this synthetic biology at its full um, options in cyanobacteria. And what I'm mentioning here actually is not necessarily limited to cyanobacteria, but uh, it is also the case for them. So if we look at this uh, cycle here, in each of these stages, essentially there are certain, I would say challenges um, that will basically kill a project if, if this is not given. So if you look at the design part, so for example, if you want to integrate or if you want to modify an organism and you do not have a genome sequence, well, it's not really going to be possible. How are you going to know where in the genome to integrate your construct or something like that? So really you need a genome sequence and it needs to be annotated in order to start designing something. Then in the build phase, um, same problem. So if you do not have a promoter that you know works in this organism, if you do not have genetic tools in general, no markers maybe, uh, or you also do not have a system in order to transform this organism, well then you're not going to be able to engineer it and then basically the project stops here. Um, concerning the test phase, well, um, specifically for cyanobacteria, I would say compared to other heterotrophic organisms, quite often I would say we're quite behind in the amount of screening and high, throat, high throughput methods that we actually have available for us. And there have been several studies addressing this, for example, if you look uh, for a recent paper from Paul Hudson's group looking at a pool CRISPR-I um, um, libraries in order to um, screen for enhanced uh, industrial phenotypes, things like that. These are really important developments, but um, we need more of that and we don't have that much of that yet. And in the end, if we get to the learn stage, well, um, learning something, maybe you might think that this is limited to what you know about something, but it might not be limited to what you know, it might be limited to what we know as a community about these organisms. So we do need a general understanding of the physiology and also of the metabolism of uh, these organisms. So basically what we need is we need the cellular context to interpret our results. And that can sometimes be quite limiting in cyanobacteria. We just don't know as much as we know, for example, for E. coli. Good, however, what that means is, as a conclusion from this, is synthetic biology will be limited to some extent to um, organisms that are well characterized which in most of the cases will be model cyanobacteria that are genetically tractable. So this is something we just have to keep in mind. So whenever we try to use these things, we're kind of a little bit limited, although this is getting better uh, to what we already know and that we've already started in more detail. Um, I mentioned earlier that part of synthetic biology is sort of this really big idea of standardizing things and making them um, be useful across systems and across labs, for example. And um, there's many um, examples where kits and tools have been developed for different uh, cyanobacteria. And I cannot mention them all, but I wanted to highlight this one here from uh, 2019. It's called Cyanogate, and this is very much in the synthetic biology realm of things. So this um, Cyanogate is a Moclo uh, system. It's a Golden Gate system that is based on the plant Moclo syntax, which means that then it's easier to actually share parts between these different systems and to transfer them. Um, and basically what you do is you have your individual parts here in level zero, for example, a promoter or a gene of interest, and then you assemble them in level one into transcriptional units. And then these transcriptional units can be put together in level T. And then depending on what you're interested in, there's different level T backbones to either integrate it or to have self-replicative plasmids to transform into your cyanobacterium of interest. And there's actually tools for um, several different uh, cyanobacteria. So if you're interested, um, this is also available on Argy and this kit has been uh, developed uh, by Alistair McCormick's uh, lab in Edinburgh. Okay, so now we maybe have an idea of what synthetic biology is. And now the question is, um, what are sort of the examples where synthetic biology has been used or applied to sort of improve cyanobacterial chassis. And here I clearly really have to say that I cannot do justice to all this work that has been done. There have been some really great studies on how to do this and, what's, and showing what cyanobacteria can do, what kind of potential they have. They have. But I would say in general, if we look at an overview of products that are interesting from these uh, organisms, we can separate them into commodities and fuels. So for example, many alcohols, alkanes, alkenes have been produced, sugars or also hydrogen. Uh, if you look at more high value compounds and um, people have um, expressed recombinant proteins, recombinant enzymes, 
natural products and natural products is maybe more of a, a niche thing in the sense of that cyanobacteria have natively sometimes very interesting natural products but this can be limited to actually understanding um, their biosynthesis itself so quite often when we talk about high value compounds these are sort of secondary metabolites for example from plants that have been characterized in other organisms so for example isoprenoids or phenylpropanoids just to give uh, an example um, also pigments so obviously cyanobacteria have pigments natively um, but then we can also as we will see uh, engineer their native metabolism towards um, other pigments that they might not naturally produce so in the end um, as you can see here synthetic biology biotechnology how this all fits together for uh, cyanobacteria is majorly down to actually engineering these guys and improving them and um, as I said, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot do justice to all this work that has been done. But what I was thinking is I would give a couple of examples of very, very recent uh, papers where they have been employing um, sort of these strategies to, to make cyanobacteria more effective chassis. Uh, the first example I wanted to give um, is about a pigment. So this is astaxanthin. And actually in 6803, this is a typical model organism that you've probably heard a lot about by now. Basically, astaxanthin is not naturally produced in, in Synecocystis. What Synecocystis does produce, however, is beta carotene, which is a precursor of astaxanthin. So what they did in this study is they basically expressed uh, hydrolase and the catalase to then um, add in the biosynthetic pathway to get from beta carotene via camptosanthin and zeaxanthin down to astaxanthin and produce it. And what is quite impressive about this study is more the amount of work they went through to then in iterative cycles improve the system um, to get rid of bottlenecks, um, for example, here to have beta carotene availability and to then also go further up into central carbon metabolism and, and MAP pathway, for instance, here, um, in order to improve that system. And I think by the end in the paper, they were at strain number 29 or something where they did uh, steps of improving and testing different enzymes to, to get these uh, uh, cyanobacteria to really produce a lot of astaxanthin. So take a look, this is a nice recent example of uh, metabolic engineering in cyanobacteria. So the second example is maybe a little bit different and maybe I really wanted to show this because I think it's really important that we, you know, we start thinking a little bit out of the box about the issues that we're having and how we can address them. And basically this is from Patrick Jones uh, lab at Imperial College London and what they've been doing is uh, they looked at derivatizing products. So they did this with octanol, I think. So basically this is the product here that we would be interested in to produce. Um, but what they suggest is that actually like within the cell, we can engineer the cell in order to uh, derivatize this product of interest to make it less toxic, um, more or less soluble to the cell and make it therefore um, be different and not available maybe for the general metabolism of, of the cell. So the idea is, for example, you can make it more hydrophilic by glycosylating it or more hydrophobic, uh, hydrophobic through esterification. And really the idea here is to make uh, the biology inside the cell to work together with the chemi chemistry then later on so that basically we derivatize the product in the cell to make it less toxic and then be also able to accumulate at higher levels inside the cell. And then afterwards, um, what we can do is we can use chemistry to um, then remove this uh, derivatization and basically um, get the product that we were actually interested out. So I think this is a nice idea of how we need to think about, you know, how can we improve our systems from a bit of a different angle. Uh, and finally, I have one more example I wanted to show you. And this is really more a, a general principle and it's called light driven catalysis. And this has been uh, developed um, starting in around uh, Polaric Jensen in Copenhagen and colleagues. And basically uh, the idea here of light driven catalysis is that actually we can use photosynthesis essentially of course to produce something, but actually we can not indirectly only use photosynthesis because we need it to actually for the cell to live and to build up biomass and everything, but we can directly also use these electrons from photosynthesis so here we have, for example, photosystem two, photosystem one. This is the photosynthetic electron transport chain. And basically there's a lot of electrons um, that sort of go through the system and then they have to be taken care of. Um, and the idea is that we can directly use these electrons to supply them um, to redox enzymes, such as, for example, this P450 here, um, in order to drive uh, catalysis of these enzymes. 
Um, and there's different examples. Um, so this doesn't have to be from the photosynthetic electrotransport chain. This can also be, for example, through a photosensitizer. Uh, but in the end, we sort of kind of try to show different categories of light driven catalysis. And this is explained in this review in a little bit more detail. Uh, what I want to do is give you um, this example here in A in a little bit more detail. So basically, the idea is that we have um, photosynthesis that is operating in the cell anyway in the thylakoid membranes here. And what we can do is basically we can express cytochrome P450s. And usually what they need is they need an oxidoreductase. And this oxidoreductase will feed the electrons for catalysis, for example, here from tyrosine, um, through um, essentially getting them from NADH, NADPH. And this step from the oxidoreductase to P450 can be very limiting. But when we now heterologously express these P450s, in the thylakoid membrane, what we basically get is that we get these electrons from photosynthesis and we can feed them to the P450s uh, for substrate turnover. Um, so this is sort of the general idea of this. And the first paper actually started with only one enzyme. This is CYP79 from the Durin pathway um, in Synecococcus. Uh, but then later on, as you see here in the picture, and um, the whole pathway was also transferred in the synecocystis where we have two P450s and um, one UGT to actually produce uh, durin from tyrosine in vivo uh, using basically the energy from photosynthesis to drive these enzymes. Um, why am I showing you this? Well, what I would like to do is um, just very briefly also touch upon how this sort of fits into the work that we are doing. So um, coming from Blair Jensen's lab, I was quite interested in this and just sort of still looking into these light driven catalysis systems and how can we actually improve them further. And part of that is that we're also doing some prospecting to look at um, good model pathways. Um, sometimes there can be a lot of toxic intermediates and if you want to do high throughput screening or something like that, this might not be the best option. Um, so for example, Sayali that we see here, she's working on sort of figuring out if we can um, establish some nice model pathways in our cyanobacteria to study this. And part of this is also a lot of these enzymes are membrane bound. So really we have to understand how can we sometimes proteins from very different organisms, how can we reliably target these proteins into the membranes, into the thylakoid membranes usually of cyanobacteria? And how can we basically employ metabolic and, and, and genetic engineering to then integrate this pathway further into uh, the central metabolism of, this, uh, of, of these cyanobacteria? And how can we sort of uh, funnel the energy into the product that we're interested in? And there's also Annika and Dennis, they're also working on this, more on these two topics. So um, all of them um, will be attending the conference and I'm sure they will be happy to talk to you about their projects in more detail. So that is uh, about improving light driven catalysis, but we're also interested in sort of the general idea of how can we achieve efficient metabolic channeling. So it's not necessarily about a specific product. So I'm not a company that you know, wants to uh, produce as much as possible of one compound. For me, it's more about how can we you know, find principles in general to make these cyanobacteria be more attractive and uh, be better at producing something. So if you think in general of an enzymatic pathway, usually it involves several um, enzymes. And that means that they have to work together you have intermediates that form that have to find their way from one to the next enzyme. And you all know there's a lot that can go wrong along the way. So the idea is that we should maybe consider in more detail how can we maybe make these things work more efficiently? How can we build metabolic units and achieve some form of metabolic channeling? Um, this usually also comes with a detoxification because that means that if you have some intermediates that are toxic, for example, well, if you all basically put your enzymes into the same subcellular um, compartment, well, then um, these intermediates will not show up as much and it will be actually better for the cell. So in the end, the idea is to co-localize and to build sort of these metabolic units um, for more efficient product synthesis. Um, this can be, like I said, by encapsulating it, or it can also be by just providing a scaffold where the enzymes of a specific pathway can attach to come in closer localization to uh, achieve sort of similar effects without having to get the substrate sort of into a compartment and then getting the product out. Okay, this is just um, sort of the general overview. Um, here, specifically the scaffolding uh, project, uh, actually my PhD student Alexandra is working on that quite a bit. So if you're interested in that, you can ask her about what she's been doing and where we are with that. 
Um, one more last thing I wanted to mention is that this goes very much into um, what I said about the problem with uh, the learn phase of, um, of synthetic biology in cyanobacteria. So as I said, we're really interested in making sure that we get our enzymes into a certain specific subcellular localization, but how do we achieve this? And we're kind of very limited to some extent quite often by understanding the, the underlying cellular mechanisms of how we can target something to a subcellular compartment. And for example, here for protein translocation, we know what systems operate in these organisms, but we don't really know how they make sure that, for example, something goes into the periplasm or something goes into the thylakoid lumen. So we're really also interested from a fundamental point of view of how, um, you know, how things work in these organisms to then advance this for in our applications. So this brings me to my take home messages, I guess. Um, in the end, um, uh, basically what I was trying to tell you is that, as you can see, there are still multiple challenges and limitations that are kind of holding back the transfer of cyanobacteria into an industrial setting. But there is also um, already studies that show that things are working. So we have um, an implementation on an industrial scale of cyanobacteria. We have a good example, we have spirulina. Um, then there is interesting trends that I think are important to advance us as a community, which is, for example, these fast-growing strains. Um, then there is many, many proof-of-concept studies that really show what cyanobacteria can do. But really now what we need to do is sort of take this to the next level to actually implement this further. And I think to do that, um, quite often synthetic biology concepts can actually aid this, uh, this process. And to make uh, our systems improve also on a, on a shorter time scale. So in a nutshell, um, what I hope that you uh, take away from this is that cyanobacteria do have an interesting potential for biotechnology, specifically for sustainable biotechnology. And um, we're only sort of at the starting point to explore also how on a larger scale we can sort of implement the systems, what are the challenges and how can we implement them. So really what I'm trying to say is, I think they deserve further attention and it's very nice that I got an opportunity to talk sort of to the new generation also about this here at the conference um, and we really need more people interested in that and working on this to, to advance these things faster. So as a closing question, this goes really to the audience here. Um, I would be quite interested in hearing what you actually think, you know, do you see that synthetic biology um, can make it happen or not? So yeah, penny for your thoughts. Uh, I would be really nice to discuss this in more detail. Um, and these are my acknowledgements. So um, these are people that I'm currently actively working with. And uh, apart from them, of course, mainly my group, I would also like to thank you for listening to me and for following me through this uh, presentation. And um, if you don't catch me or my group at the conference, uh, get in touch if you're interested, be it by Twitter, by email, or in any other possible way. So thank you for your attention.